Um, so the purpose for just quickly the, the purpose for this workshop is to look at three interrelated tools that allow the reproducibility of, of research and data science, which are our markdown data dashboards or web applications. We'll um, mention what the slight difference may be, but they are interchangeable terms, data dashboards and web applications. And then Binder, which is a, a slightly new tool, which is great for the reproducibility of, of coding environments. Um, let's see, uh, maybe we can start with the first section. So our first section is our markdown, and the uh, first uh, uh, we'll be looking at markdown, which is a, a markup language. Markup being a, a styling uh, language for um, for writing uh, computational documents. So we have some background there and an example, and I'm now going to demonstrate. Uh, screen we have here an example of the of the um, of a, a markdown document uh, which is in the rstudio.cloud project. It's called uh, html.css and in the, um, and there's a link as well in um, here, which is uh, yeah, a link to GitHub. In that link, can you see my screen live right now, the GitHub repo, Florencia? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. Here in the GitHub repo, we have uh, this um, bullet point, which is example of HTML and CSS use. And uh, there's an instruction there. You may paste that code, which is this one, into a, an R markdown uh, editor or indeed even a markdown editor such as hackmd.io and it will render the following. So this is the code and this is for it renders. Um, this is HTML and CSS and the, the reason why I'm mentioning HTML and CSS at this point is because our markdown documents allow for an extension of the um, straightforward R markdown uh, format. And wh what is the straightforward R markdown format? Well, uh, now we are in our studio and we'll begin by using this uh, button at the top left, which we're going to use quite often. Top left. We have a drop down here, and one of the important drop downs is the third one, R markdown, which will create a standard R markdown document for us. Um, we can enter here a title, which will automatically fill in in our document and our name. And we can choose between HTML, PDF, and Word, which are output formats. The most flexible and nicest one is HTML, which allows all the possibilities that the others do, plus some others. Uh, and this has created this um, this template, which we will have to now save. Um, that only created it and filled this in for us. And now we'll have to save it. Control S, click on Control S or, or Command S in your keyboard, and just save that. As, uh, however you wish to, you may enter a, a file name there. Um, now, uh, this has created uh, the default template for our markdown. Um, let's quickly look at our markdown format. So um, we have the background 
link in the etherpad which takes us to um to the r studios uh, advice for for markdown in brief uh where what we do is we create a, a reproducible document that uh <clears throat> where we will have a, a code basis and an output right so that's that's the idea and this is the code basis and when we need that need being synonymous for uh, compile or render or create um it will create our output so we have the base code base and the output uh, and in the code base we we use these uh, commands or um code for for creating the formatting of the text so for instance this we create a bold formatting a single if we use a single asterisk on each side it will be italics um we can use uh also code uh, uh so code chunks this is a code chunk we can create inline code using a single backtick these are three backticks for code chunks and if we use inline code so for instance anywhere around here we could say um right um or this so we, this will render you can now render it this is called inline code so a backtick on each side uh, this is a very simple uh, example but we can use data in there as well uh, so this has now uh, styled the code for us now to run that uh, this is just code styling to run that that uh, with r we place an r at the very beginning so right after the first backtick, we place an R. And we'll need that, and you'll see the difference. Uh, let's take a look at that, target of assignment. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> results. Results equals two by two or just that, that would only let's say just that because that would, that would only create a, an object for us so see how far so basically that has just run our code right so if we have data here which we do for instance we have the uh, cars uh, data set in, in the example so we can say let's look at how many rows we have in the cars uh, data set back tick back tick r and row cars that fait cette maison là ou bien non c'était un autre chose ça c'est le jardin tout à fait ah ouais cool uh, participants, uh, a reminder, please. Uh, me. Mm -hmm. So, um, the cafe is cool, Kada. So, 50, right? So uh, let's look at how many rows we have in the cars data set because we entered the code there. So let's see how this matches exactly. So so this inline code corresponds to this 50 here. Uh, this is great because it's, uh, it allows for the reproducibility of our um, output at any point with a one-to-one -one correspondence. 
uh, to, to a large extent. And we can use at the end, we'll look at binder because that will further facilitate uh, our, our purposes for package dependencies, package versions, etc. Uh, next in line is HTML, CSS. Uh, so that was Markdown. We could, um, I'll mention also links. So if we put a link text here, a link URL, right? So do that example, and this will create a link for us. So this is our Markdown uh, code. We can, ex because uh, our Markdown allows this inline code, uh, formatting links and code chunks, basically, we can extend that to um, allow for colors, for uh, further underlining, for further formatting. Uh, how does that play out? Well, uh, this sort of stuff, paragraphs, for instance, is not something that our Markdown does for us. And we can do this with HTML. Uh, there's a, a copy of, of that uh, code in the Etherpad as well as in the RStudio Cloud project. Uh, so that's, uh, we can, uh, just for, for you to know, we can actually extend our Markdown to the Markdown docu uh, format to, with HTML. Um, next is um, running code and cross-referencing. Let's look at, uh, well, these are background links. Uh, we're going to be working with these, um, this uh, Markdown uh, code, our Markdown code, which we have in the RStudio Cloud project called uh, under the name of parks.rmd. Uh, so parks.rmd. Uh, you can see the link to the RStudio Cloud. Right. Here, I'm going to copy it here as well. Right, um, so this is the link. Uh, and uh, the the file in that uh, in that uh, RStudio Cloud project is called parks.rmd. These parks are from Madison, which was going to be the city where the Carpentry Con conference was going to take place. It's a very simple data set about parks, open data. Uh, and uh, let's begin to look at, um, again, a reminder of what we just briefly looked at. Um, I'll, uh, so basically some markdown formats here, links, um, et cetera. Uh, I'm going to now mention the YAML header, what, um, YAML header, which is this one, which by default has, our, uh, has a title. We can add a subtitle. By default, it has an author and it has an output. Uh, in the output, the default one is uh, HTML document. We're going to replace that with a Bookdown uh, for, uh, format. Uh, the Bookdown package greatly extends the R Markdown uh, framework. Uh, again, it's called Bookdown package. Let me see if I should. The Bookdown package and it's the HTML um, document to column default. We will use this because we want to use a feature of uh, our, the Bookdown package, which is known as cross referencing. There's a link to that in, uh, in the background. Uh, so that's cross-referencing. Uh, cross-referencing is a tool uh, to um, refer to bits 
the code in a code um, in a computational way. Participant, please uh, mute your your microphones. Sorry. Uh, thank you. So. Uh, so, um, so uh, cross-referencing with cross-referencing, we can refer to plots and tables in a, in a again in a one-to-one -one correspondence uh, that will remain um, consistent uh, over time. Uh, so, what does this do? Well, uh, if you know when you create any document, any paper, you may be uh, desiring to add. Uh, further plots and tables and sections um, as, as you go uh, into the middle of the document. And then you have to rename and renumber every one of those sections, uh, plots or tables, if, if you do put in anything in the middle. Uh, this avoids that potential for repetition as well as errors. Uh, and it's indeed a one-to-one -one correspondence of uh, text and code. Um, and how does this work? Well, let's look at the first example here uh, where we have a code chunk. Uh, this is how a code chunk works. So three backticks, uh, curly brackets, R, uh, this, will re this R is the same one that we put into uh, an inline code after the first uh, uh, backtick. So this is uh, telling R to actually use R because it's uh, open to other languages uh, in R Studio. Now the next after a space is the label for our code chunk. So we can name this however we want to as long as it's a single um, word. Uh, it can be a compound um, united or joined by hyphens by but um, but it's a, a single word chunk. So we can use pretty much as many words as we wish, as long as they're joined by hyphens. So this is our label. And this is very important. Uh, next, we will want a caption. Whether we have a, a table or a figure, we will want a, a caption. For a table, we can use, uh, we can create a caption in this way. So. We we'll have a comma after uh, the label, and we we'll create a caption: fig dot cap equals um, inverted commas, and then the caption. Uh, this is specified in the cross-referencing. So we want a book down output format, which was um, which was this one. We want a caption and we want a label code chunk. Now we have everything we need. And this is the reference in the text to that uh, figure or that uh, table, or whatever it is. Uh, in this case, we are going to have a, a figure first. And um, this is how we do it. So in the text, this is just a placeholder text. Uh, here we have figure and this is replacing the number. So what we're replacing with this reference is just the number for the figure, uh, which will auto be automatically updated if we add any figures in the middle. And we begin with a uh, back, backslash. Uh, this is the backslash, which is uh, different from the one we have in URLs, right? This is forward slash. This is back, backslash. Uh, this is used in otherwise in coding for escaping characters and that kind of stuff. Then we have a NAT sign. Then we have ref, R-E-E-F. Then we have a parenthesis. Then we have fig, if we have a figure. So we'll be distinguishing the types of uh, outputs that we will have. For figure, we have fig, colon. And now we have the label. We close the parenthesis and that, that's finally it. <laughs> so it's, at first it's a bit complicated, but once you know what it is, uh, it's, uh, it's not that, that bad. Right, so that's, that's what we have there. Um, we, we can now look at the version for the table. For the table, 
it's pretty much the same, only changing for uh, the parts of the caption. The caption will have to be slightly different. So it's the same also tab. Now we change from fig to tab. Otherwise, it's being the same. And then, of course, we are going to use the label that we use. We, we will want then different labels. Obviously, we, we cannot repeat the same labels if we are using these cross references. Um, this is the same as before, but now here we are not going to have the table caption here um, because uh, we will be using the cable, which is standard in our, our studio for creating a table, which can then be extended with other packages, but this is the, the standard. And with the cable, um, we have the caption within the cable function. So this is a, an important difference. Right, so we don't have tab.cap. Uh, well, some people have proposed that, but we have the caption right here within the cable function. Yeah, so if we need that, we can see the output. And what, what have we done? So figure one. So for, if we have a very long document, not only will this uh, have been automatically uh, numbered, but it will have a link that will take us straight to the output. So that's figure one. Um, and what else? Uh, and, oh, and then we have the caption for a figure. It will automatically place the caption at the bottom of the figure. Let's look at the table now. This is where we have the table. Table one shows, again, link. And for a table, it will place the caption at the top of the table. So that's uh, cross-references. Uh, basically, uh, further options uh, exist for, for other types of uh, sections, uh, for, for equations and other types. All documentation is in the book down uh, documentation online. Uh, in this uh, great book by Yihui, Yihui Shi and, uh, and colleagues. Um, next, we're going to look at, um, well, that's, uh, that was cross-referencing. Uh, running code, perhaps uh, I can now mention code. I mentioned it in passing for um, inline code, mainly, right? Now for a code chunk, um, we have been uh, viewing it already. Um, so this is a code chunk. Again, R label. Uh, conveniently, R Studio also creates here uh, 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 an access to our code chunks as well as even sections. So we have an access to it all uh, with the labels here, which is convenient for very long documents. So three backticks curly brackets are labeled. Then here, afterwards, we can have options. And these are uh, important things. So um, again, there's a documentation in our markdown for neater options or code chunk options. Important ones are, first of all, echo. Echo is whether we want or, or don't want to display the code before, right before the outputs. Next we have eval, which is whether we want to actually run that code or not. If we say we don't, then we'll only be, we, we may only be displaying the code. So if we were to have our code true, yeah, sorry, equal true, eval um, false, what we would have is displaying this code but not running that. If we have echo true and eval true, what we will have is both the output and the, uh, and the code. And it will place first the code and followed by the output. Uh, there are a, a large number of options, which we have as quickly as we enter a comma here. We are, are offered by our studio a set of options. 
uh, which are a great number of them. Um, so we have mentioned echo, eval. Um, other important ones are warning and message. Warning and message are for whether we want to display any warnings or message from R. Often we will not. And why is that? Because again, as I mentioned before, we have the code bases and the outputs. And therefore, often in the output, we will want to present something that's readable, human readable and nice to present. And whoever wants to look at warnings and messages and, and a host of other options can always go up to the code basis, which is the .rmd document, and just uh, edit away and, and display any, anything that they wish, uh, even package versions, they can just edit the code and, and display anything, anything else. Um, what else? Uh, uh, so that was basically running code and uh, cross-references, which is how I'm doing time-wise uh, fast as, as uh, uh, So now we have dashboards and web applications. Um, Flex dashboard and Flex dashboard shiny. Uh, Flex dashboard is an R markdown format, basically. So, well, no, it, it is a type of R markdown format from the Flex dashboard package from R Studio. We have that already preloaded in our R Studio Cloud project, uh, and we have an example document called Butterfly Species Richness, etc. So, if you click on on that, open that. Uh, there's a link to it also in the Etherpad to to GitHub. Uh, you will notice now that it looks similar, fairly similar to a standard R Markdown document. The way we create this is R Markdown. We have uh, previously loaded the Flex Dashboard uh, package. And we'll go now, instead of creating a standard R Markdown format, we'll go to From Template. This is an important, very convenient option, From Template. Create. Uh, we will want to load the Flex dashboard library. So this is important. Install the Flex dashboard package and load the Flex dashboard library. Now, uh, let me see. Uh, I'm going to do it in my local R. So um, these are a host of uh, of templates, um, we will need to install the packages and, and load them. And one of these templates, uh, we have the packages that created these templates, the articles for creating articles, um, etc. One of them is from Flex Dashboard here, so we we'll click on OK, um, and it has created a, um, and now it will offer us saving it. Now, uh, here is the default um, structure for our Flex dashboard. And here we have, um, fairly similarly to a standard R Markdown document, we have a YAML header, uh, which starts with and finishes with three hyphens on each end, title, uh, we, can add sub, uh, we can add author, I don't think subtitle, but author, uh, we can add, um, and, and then we'll have output. Uh, the output has been automatically filled in as Flex Dashboard package, Flex Dashboard uh, format, then orientations, either columns or rows, and vertical layout, fill or scroll, uh, or some other options. These are more advanced options. Um, here, like in a, in a um, standard R Markdown uh, document, we have the setup. Uh, which is convenient for loading um, packages, as well as we can also use it for loading data, data sets. Uh, so this is a code chunk labeled setup. Include false. Include false is for uh, running the code, but not, not showing any output from it. Um, but it may, it may show uh, warnings and messages unless we um, create 
the the option for for avoiding them. Um, next in a flex dashboard we have columns and and rows. Uh, if we are using the orientation columns format here, we'll have uh, columns displayed like this. So column, then curly brackets, and then the options that we wish to enter here. This is for pixels, so 650 pixels. Um, then uh, we have this, which uh, well, creates a column. And this is the heading for our column. This is a code chunk. And these are rows now. So each of these uh, three uh, asterisks are creating rows for us. Uh, so this is, has been created by default. And here we can enter in each. So what do we have in this basic structure? We have um, two columns. The first column having um, one row, the second column having two rows. We can need this and see what this default empty structure. And we can just fill this in with our own code. So this is the default structure. So one column, uh, so two columns, uh, single, and two rows in the second column. And here we can display anything we wish, text, links, tables, plots, uh, results from analysis, anything. Um, so that's Flex Dashboard. And then uh, moving on to um, the code demo here. So uh, if we look at the uh, code demo here, butterfly species, we can need this. This is another flex dashboard, one that is not a template. So, um, so we have created here these tabs um, using a theme, and the theme is the cerulean theme. Um, and we have modified this to have scroll. You can you can modify some settings, but essentially it's it's the same. So. Uh, here we are having now two columns, actually, uh, which for which we have access here. Uh, and these columns are filling the whole uh, sections. And we are, uh, so Flex Dashboard and our Markdown are great for interactive formats. So um, we can display any, any interactive uh, documents. Mm. Next, um, uh, we can extend this with Shiny, and we will be looking at Shiny in the next section in this workshop. OK, uh, so now we're going to move on to a task. Uh, and this task is uh, based on the materials that I, that I uh, just showed before. The R Markdown document is the Madison Parks uh, documents and the Flex Dashboard is the uh, Butterflies uh, Flex Dashboard. So um, please go ahead, please uh, look at the instructions in the uh, Etherpad. Please feel free and encouraged to ask any questions. Uh, I mentioned that Flex Dashboard is a type of R Markdown document, although we refer to them separately here. You may absolutely use your own data if you wish and ask for any advice. Um, otherwise, you have here a set, a large number of possibilities for tasks, uh, beginning from more simple to more complex. You are also encouraged to look at them after the workshop as well, if you wish. But right now, let's head to the tasks. So you may choose, depending on your preference and expertise, whichever you wish. I will be here, and my colleague Florencia will also be here. Uh, available for any questions and, and advice. Uh, let's see whether we already have any questions. Uh, just wanted to let you know that the recording hasn't started. Oh, that's a, uh, that may be from some time. Yeah, okay. Uh, 
Right. Um, thanks to you for, for attending. Uh, so yeah, now no, that, that started. Uh, so yeah, uh, please everyone feel uh, free to head to the tasks, choose whichever you prefer. They're ordered from more complex to more, from, more, from easier to more complex. So some possibilities are just questions, basically, just replacing some code, and others are, are more elaborate. I'm going to demonstrate now this one, for instance. So we have to here, and we add a chunk option in the, um, we have our files here in the parks. Parks.rmd. This is how we add a chunk option, false or true. Warning and message. Well, that's just the demonstration. And the result is that if we were to have any uh, warnings or messages, which is often the case with our code, that they, you know, as, as you may know, they need not indicate anything bad. They're just often packaged messages. Uh, they'll be displayed. Often we, we will not to want to display that in the output the document. Some other possibilities for tasks include uh, changing the labels of the code chunks, largest parts. So you will need to change both the label, right? The, the, the two matching labels. So that's, that's the parks uh, document. And these are our two matching labels. This one matches this one. And our studio conveniently even highlights the bits of code that are the same. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, uh, no worries. Yeah, so um, I, I am aware that this is a, a, a packed um, workshop and, and depending on, on well, the, the extent to which you already have RStudio ready, you may or, or may not immediately access. So for, for that purpose to actually allow um, all participants to, to uh, learn something during this time, I'm going to demonstrate some of the tasks. So uh, if we want to replace this, we are going to replace both, right? So uh, you can just use any other, um, That's it. That's matching, right? Now, um, okay. Uh, and we can refer to this table again anywhere else in the document. So, uh, this is a book, a book down cross reference. So, it's automatically rendering the reference in the output. So obviously the, the, the label is not showing, but we can see that we have the link there, uh, table and um, table and figure, et cetera, et cetera. Let's look at another one. Um, <clears throat> Mm, let's look at the, yeah, so um, <clears throat> let's look at a slightly <clears throat> more complex, perhaps, um, example of a cross-reference, which is a, a, a useful one. So we can refer to a code chunk. So we have been looking at how to refer to plots and tables, and we can even refer to a code chunk uh, using a label. So how do we do that? Um, Let's, let's see, so uh, 
we're going to refer to the largest parks, which is now the greatest parks label. Um, yeah, so that's the second code chunk in the document, the one for the table. Um, this is a label for our code chunk. Now using that, we can create here uh, at any point uh, a sort of template for a code chunk that will not have any code in it actually. So all, all it will have is this structure and in the middle there will be nothing. And uh, I believe we could even, for clarity, we could even leave this space here, but it's empty. And what we do is we have a ref.label equals, and then with inverted commas or quotation marks, we have the label. And then we have any options that we wish to have. And how does that work? We need, and let's see. So echo true, eval false. Yeah, eval false, right? Eval false, right? Um, right, exactly. So um, echo true is echoing the code. It's showing, displaying just the code. It's not evaluating. Evaluating means running, really. It's running the code. It's not running the code. It's just displaying that code. So that was empty. And by sort of magic, cross-reference magic, it is now displaying the code from that uh, code chunk for which we entered the label. I, is, I hope this is fairly clear, please. Uh, at any point in this workshop, feel free to uh, drop any questions here. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, you need the, uh, the, only the R markdown package which you can use. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Renato. Uh, now we are going to change an option there in that code chunk, and we are going to change eval false to true. T stands for true, so we can either put T or true or ref or false, you know. So knit and shazam. So that has now run the code and therefore we have repeated the 20 largest parks table here and here, but we have not had to repeat. And this is convenient because then, uh, why is this convenient? Because if we were to need to change this code, we would only have to change the code once and not have to copy paste it into every repetition of the code. Right? So this is our empty cross-referenced code chunk. Echo true, now to demonstrate again the echoing option. Remember it was showing before, and now if we choose false, it's not going to show. But the output is still going to show. So no code and still the output because we have echo false, eval true. Um, Now, uh, notice that uh, well that's, that's, this is actually just a reference to the table. So distinguish, we need to distinguish between um, where is Parks. Yeah, we, we will want to distinguish. No, uh, yeah, so I mentioned, notice that in the output, when you are doing these uh, things of cross-referencing, uh, in the text, it will be sending you to the first instance of the output. So it will be mentioning table one, right? Even now you have table two here, see what I mean? So uh, just because it's, it's repeated, so it's, the code sort of knows that it's, it's just repeating. But still, because it's another table here in the caption, it's going to call it table two, right? Because normally you, you, you will not want to repeat the um, 
the, the, the output, right? Maybe for showing, probably this, this option is more useful actually for the type of echo true, echo true eval false, because then you can show your code at any point, for instance, in the appendix, um, but, uh, but not uh, run it. Okay, uh, let's look at another example, uh, another task. Um, let's look at this one. This is a different instance in which we are using the Plotly package to, um, to create an interactive plot. Uh, and the Plotly package can be used in, in R by installing and loading the Plotly uh, <laughs> package and wrapping the uh, ggplot code in the functions, in the, in the function ggplotly. We have an example of that in the parks.rmd document here. So ggplotly, and uh, this is uh, especially convenient for our markdown documents where we may have an HTML output and therefore we can show these things. Uh, so just wrapping a ggplot in, in the ggplotly command uh, is going to uh, to do that for us. Uh, yeah. So, for clarity of purpose, this is the uh, ggplot. This corresponds to ggplot two. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, just wrapping a ggplot in a ggplot command. What does that? What that does for us is do this. So instead of just having the usual plot, which does look like it, if we actually um, well uh, hover over it, uh, it will show um, a tooltip with outputs, and we can actually. Uh, modify the output using the um, text, to the text and the text, um, and the text uh, code option. So um, how do we go about that? Well, it's right here. Within the aesthetic for our ggplot, we can modify that. Why have I, why did I modify that? For the following bits, because if we don't modify that, and we delete this and that, if we need that, this is what we get. So it's going to be displaying this in this tooltip, um, sort of this uh, straight. Uh, so it's not going to adapt the, the text and this doesn't look uh, very readable. So to edit that, we can uh, edit the code using this option. So it's text um, within the aesthetic, it's a text um, argument followed by a paste function followed by in inverted commas. Well, it, well then uh, your sort of paste function in R where, where you may combine text in inverted commas with code to be run, which is, in this case is count types. Count types is this one, it's R, R, Y. So here we are saying, don't display that stuff, display this stuff uh, and we could, now add, um, what do we have here? Right. Uh, type. And type, right? So now we're going to be doing that. And if we wish to um, separate that, the dashboard in two giant code chunks rather than two small, more smaller, uh, so we, we got a question. Um, is there a technical reason you have your dashboard in two giant code chunks rather than two smaller uh, code chunks? Um, 
Uh, I let's see. So the dashboard is referring to this one. Um, I well, to me, having created it, uh, it has several code chunks, uh, right? So if if you look at it, it has it has many very many different code chunks and sections, right? So this is creating a section, sampling site, uh, which is uh, output it as um, I'll put it as a, as a, as a tab at the, at the top, and then it's creating a, you have to create a column even, even if you don't want to sort of have a column proper, uh, you, you will create a, a column for the format. Um, and then the heading, which I have formatted using HTML. So, uh, so this is sampling sites, right? And this is species details, uh, a similar one, but further at the bottom. So actually, uh, yeah, so I, see, I, I can see that it's a very low, uh, large uh, document, but yeah, uh, but splitting, I suppose there could even be a cross-reference sort of splitting this into several R Markdown documents in, in some way, but, um, yeah, whether you want to do that, you you might just for, for thesis, for instance, it's it's done when the R Markdown document is very very large. Yeah. Okay. So I hope that responds to the question. So there are uh, several sections and code chunks and yeah, different different stuff. Um, this is uh, HTML used here to format the heading, to include which you can use to include uh, Markdown links. Our markdown format it can also be used there. Um, okay, so um, there we go. So, uh, right, so that was uh, ggplotly, and we can uh, edit this. We need, and we follow this with a call to uh, tooltip, the, the argument tooltip equals text in the ggplotly function because we want to use the tooltip that we name here text and what has done that that done for us this so count follow by type if we want it and with this i'm going to finish and uh move on to uh my colleague's shiny section uh we can separate uh, this code and type using uh, our markdown or HTML code. Uh, there it is. So now we have separated that into two lines count and type. Yeah? Okay, so there are a host of other tasks which you are very welcome to, to practice later. And now we are going to move on to uh, Shiny, which is a great format from our studio, which you can also add to the Flex dashboard format. But with Florencia, we're going to look at the Shiny proper. Okay, <laughs> so Florencia, over to you. Let me stop sharing. Uh, we have not a break now of five minutes. Yeah, we, we can. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Do you want a break? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, we change everything? Okay, five minutes. I will start sharing everything anyway. Yeah. During this break, participants feel free to actually take the break, but also if you don't feel like uh, taking it, uh, feel free to ask any questions, any clarifications in the, in the chat, and I can. Okay. okay. We can start now. Hello everyone again, my name is Florencia Andrea. The objective of this class, or this part of the workshop, is to introduce the basis on how to develop Shiny apps and then deploy them using Binder. I will not go in detail 
uh, about user interfaces, I will just keep the minimal structure for you to understand how the app works. So we have 20 minutes in which I will explain how a shiny app works, and then in the final part, we are going to deploy the app with Binder. First, what is a shiny app? I will show you two examples. Both are published. The first one is from Pablo. Uh, we can see here that is a data visualization. You have these drop down menus that allows you to select different options and the app will change in relation to that, op to that options. And also we have different tabs with different cases in relation of the of this publication. This is another shiny app. I published it in the journal of open source software. Basically, you can uh, is to analyze ecotoxicological datasets. We we have here a preloaded dataset, but you can also add your own data. And well, you have different way to visualize it, and also uh, you can explore how these uh, how different selections or criteria you can have with the data set change how uh, this fits to different distribution. This is important for ecotoxicology because then here I, I estimate some values as for example the hazard concentration five. So it is important to check how different quality criteria about the data or different species can affect these values for regulatory purposes. Okay, so this is the idea. Also, here I have uh, an, a button that allows me to download a report that is uh, basically all the choices the user did when interacted with the app and the plots. So there are a lot of things you can do. It's an interesting way to leave uh, part of your research. So I find it's interesting to, to explore. So um, at this point, if you want to divide your screen and open your RStudio and do it with me, it's possible. If not, you can just watch. Uh, I am already working in a project. So I will not open a new project for this. Um, I will start, came in here to new file, oops, and I will select shiny web app. In this case, we have to select a name, my app, I don't know, the name you want. And then uh, I will pick only one file because the app is not so big. So uh, I think it's okay, only one file for this app. We have preloaded here an example that we are not interested now uh, on it. So first of all, I will write here shiny. Shiny app. And we can see that appears something called a snippet. If I press here, we have the basic structure of a shiny app. Yes? So this first part is uh, it calls library shiny to load the shiny package. This second part is the user interfaces, is the HTML web page that you must interact with. Um, in this case, uh, well, here is where you can include the tables, the plots, the sliders, the bottoms, all the things the user will interact with. Then we have the server function. Inside the server function um, is basically a specified the behavior of the app. Yes, so it's where the R code will be living. And the last part is the function shiny app that basically uh, construct and start a shiny application combining the user interface and the server. Yes. Well, first, if I run this, we will have an empty app for you to see that this works. Okay, 
So we have just an empty shiny app, but it's the structure. So I will show you now the app we are going to, to build together. I will run up. To run a shiny app, there are different ways. You can press the button run up, or you can use the keyboard shortcuts, control shift enter, both ways works. This is the app we are going to, to go through today. Basically, I am using the Iris data set. What I want to do is uh, allow the user to select the X axis. Yes, we have two variables in this data set. One is petal width and the other sepal width. We have more variables, but I will uh, allow the user to select among these two options. Yes, so it's quite basic, but for you to have an idea where are we going. Okay, so let's return here. The first thing I will do is to include the radio buttons. Yes, and for that, I recommend you always use the shiny cheat sheet. It's uh, a nice way to remember all the functions that uh, are available inside the package. Here we have a part that says inputs. We can see all the different classes of inputs we, ha we can have. In this case, I am interested in radio buttons here that has three arguments that are important. Input ID, label, and choices. There are more, but let's, we will focus on, on these three, three of them. So we return here, and I will write radio buttons, and I will include input ID, the three arguments. label, and choices. Input ID is the name of these radio buttons for Shiny. So I have to write a name. Um, I, I will write X axis for me to know that these radio buttons are changing the axis. It's not important really which name because the user will never have a look, but it's not a bad idea to, to select a, a name that makes us remember what this was for. And then a label. The label is something that the user will see. For example, select X axis or whatever you like. And then we have the choices. I will, oops, like this. We have petal width, and sepal width. But this is, these are the names that the user will see. So let's check how Iris dataset is. When the user press petal width, I want the he, this person, the user, to select this column of the iris data set. Yes, so I will paste it here. And when the user press sepal width, I want Shiny to recognize that he want we he want to plot this column of the iris data set. So we can write in Shiny in this way, yes, to make this connection. Okay, so now if I run the app, I should have at least the radio buttons. Yes, I have the radio buttons, but <laughs> nothing else. So now, I will go to a code I already have here that is the plot, yes? 
So I I will open the chat if I can here. And if you are follow following me, I will paste this for you. If you are doing the app with me. Okay. Oh, it, it is um it is something missing at the end. It is a parenthesis missing at the end of the code I sent. Yes, thank you, Pablo. Okay. And so I came back here and I paste on the server the plot. But this will not work. But we can think together why this will not work. What happens here is that we want Shiny to replace here, where, where is the argument of the x axis for Shishi plot, the selection of the user in these radio buttons. So here we have to say something to Shiny to can connect the radio buttons with the plot. So I will start writing input because we are receiving an input here from the radio buttons, dollar sign, and then I want to connect to the radio buttons. And the name of these radio buttons is x-axis. So I will just paste this here. Oops, sorry. And here. So in this way, I have connected the election of the user in, in the user interface with the server. But now we have to come back again to the um, cheat sheet. And I want to show you these output functions. These output functions work in pairs. So we have render functions and we have output functions. Uh, they are different in relation to the output we expect. If we have a plot, we have the pair render plot, plot output. If we have an image, we have render image, image output, and so on. So in this particular case, as I want a plot, I will use the pair render plot, plot output. So I will come back here and I will write here render plot. And I will include all the, the plot inside. And after the radio buttons, I will insert a comma and write plot output. Great. So it's important here in the user interface that you realize that if you change the order of the objects, you will see them in a different order in the app. So what I'm doing here is saying that first are the radio buttons and after it will came the plot. If I change the order, it will, it will be other way. So, okay, so I have the two functions, but they are not connected yet. Uh, because imagine that we can have a lot of plots in the server and a lot of plots in the user interface. So we have to explicitly say to, to Shiny that these both things are connected. So we will say output. We will define that this is an output, dollar sign, and we will pick a name again. I will say plot. So we have now a name for this plot, and we are saying that it's an output. And I will come here to the user interface, and I will connect both things. I will say that after the radio buttons, I want a plot that is called plot. OK, so if I run the app, is basically the shiny app we have at the beginning. So this is a very basic shiny app. We can have more layout functions. For example, we can have layout, layout functions like this one to put things in these objects inside panels, as you can see in my app, for example, here, that is a sidebar panel. 
uh, there are multiple things to do. I recommend to you the book um, Master in Shiny. It's really interesting. And also it's another book called Engineering Shiny. Both of them, both of them are here in, in the Etherpad as links. And now I will copy for you the RStudio Cloud project. I have two tasks for if you want to try or if you have questions also I can answer them. I will paste it here. Uh, basically, I, I am not sure how much experience do you have with this or how easy it's for you. So what I am proposing is if you want to include, the first task could be if you want to include another set of radio buttons here, but now to change the Y axis for the two options related with the length of the Iris data set that are petal length and sepal length for these two. If you want to do that, uh, it, it is already in the, in the etherpad. If you want to check this again, what I'm saying. And then in this RStudio Cloud project, we have three apps. It's basically the same app we have been doing, uh, but there are some errors on them. Uh, I will encourage you to find the errors and fix them. We can use some minutes for this, and you can ask questions if you want. You want to start? You can start for any of those cases. Um, all right, so, so just a reminder, participants, feel free to ask any questions or, or beg for any hints. If, if there's a question there, Florencia, from Virginia. Wait. In the chat. In the UI section, one example uses plot output and another image output. They both work. Which will in be which? Question? Sorry. Yes. Continue, Pablo. Oh, so the question is: In the UI section, uh, one example uses plot output and another image output, and they both work. Which? What will be the difference? In which okay. case uh, are you? You are in this exercise, Virginia. Uh, yes, in the three, we had like three projects, three up, are. Yes, um, in number one. Yes, yes. after after seeing what, what didn't work, I believe. Yes, I don't, I don't remember which one was number one, two or three of them because they named the same. Uh, but yes, see that there's an image output and after correcting, I don't remember which was the mistake here. It actually worked. Well, we are on time, so. Don't worry, I'll ask you later. No, no, I, so I can explain it now. Ah, okay. Uh, <laughs> for everyone. Um, in this case, I. Um, in the exercise one, the the thing is that we have uh, image output and render image, so it's not okay because we have a plot, uh, and I get an error with these two two functions. So here I should write plot and render plot. And this should be running. Yes. So that was the first error or bug. The second was um, here. I don't know if any of you did it, but the problem here is that we are saying 
x axis, but we are never specifying that it, this, this is an input. So that was making this a fail. And in the last exercise, we have um, this one, well, it's, it's a typo, but here we define that the name of this output is plot, but um, here when we write the name, we use capital letters, so it's not the same name, so Shiny did not recognize this, and there is just no plot. And this is a hard thing for debugging because there is not an error really, so you don't know what is what is going on. And then if you were trying to include a new set of radio bottoms, I have a folder here called Solution Shiny Y axis with an app that includes another set of radio buttons for you to, to try this. Okay, I hope you you can go through these exercises. And if not, you can always send us an email to me or to Pablo. Um, well, so now I will start with Binder. We have some time yet. So um, there are different ways to deploy Shiny apps. Uh, today, we will learn about Binder. Also, uh, I didn't say it before, but um, in the um, in the papers, you can let also the Shiny apps as packages. That is another option. Uh, in this case, we are going to deploy it using Binder, and that's the only example I will explain today. Other option is using Shiny apps.io. You can see here that is integrated into our studio. You have uh, up to five um, apps for free, I think. Uh, but with Binder, you can just, you don't have limit. And also, there are some interesting things you can do because you also can open uh, the, the project of the app with an RStudio ID. So what is Binder? Binder is a service that generates versions of projects from a Git repository and serves them on the cloud. These binderized projects can be accessed and interact with by others via a web browser. In order to do this, Binder requires that the software and the versions required to run the project are specified. So um, basically, what we have to do first is to upload to a GitHub repository, the Shiny app. I don't know if all of you are used to GitHub and Git. Um, it's not complicated what you have to do here is open an account and create a new repo and upload the, the Shiny app. Um, so this is an example in my own repository. Uh, my account is called, is called Floor14, and I create a repo called shiny underscore carpentry um, In this case, um, is just here I have the the app the the app we have we working in inside an Iris folder. Uh, if you want to know more about Binder, more specifications, I recommend the book The Turing Way. Uh, that is also the link in the on the either path. And also there are some repositories mentioned here that are interesting to check here. And also if you are not used to Git, the book Happy With With R is quite recommendable too. But let's back here. As you can see, we have not only the folder with the Shiny app, if not two other new files. 
yes, that we are going to use them to specify these requirements of what, which software we are using, which packages we are using, which versions we are using. So that's why we are adding two new files. The first file, it is install R. This file has the packages that we use in the Shiny app. The first, um, the first package, well, Shiny and ggplot2, in this case, we are using the function install packages. So it's basically a, an R file with all the packages we use in the app. And we have another file that is called runtime.txt that has only one line that starts with, well, R, that is the name of the programming language we are using, and then a date. What does this date mean? Well, um, I will tell you about the Microsoft R application network. Every day, a snapshot of the CRAN repository is archived in the Microsoft R application network, or RAM. Um, in this file, runtime.txt, you have to specify a date. Binder will be installing the packages from CRAN, this, this CRAN snapshot, in the versions of that particular day. So specifying here a date, we will have, um, we, are that we are saying which versions of the packages we are using. So basically these are the two files we, we need to include. And then we have to go, we, we will copy the, the URL and we have to come here. This is my binder.org. It's a web page. And we have to paste here the URL we have. You can, we can use GitHub, but also there are other options at like GitLab or uh, Synodo, Fixture, other, other kind of links. And here we have to specify the branch, in this case, I am using master, so it's not even necessary, necessary to specify it if you don't want to. And then we have to press here, launch. Um, now, I will not do it because running a binder takes a while. Maybe we can be here 10 minutes waiting. Or, or, so I will not do it. I did it before. So there is already, this is already working for my repository. So. What is important now is once you launch Binder and it finished and it runs, you have to use the correct URL to call the app. In this case, I have the two options here. I will start with the shiny one. You, you have this on the either path, so you can go there again and... and And check it, we have mybinder.org, this way, this part of the link. Then we have to replace here for our user. Then we have to come here and replace it for CarpentryCon. And this is the name of my repository, the branch I am using. And if the app is in the folder, the name. So if I call the app this way, you have uh, the app deployed here. And it's quite similar to the same for to open an RStudio ID, but you have to change here Shiny for RStudio. So I will just copy the link directly and open it to this. This takes a while also to open the app. Could I, could I just mention that uh, uh, in the URL of the app, you should leave the trailing slash. So the very last mm -hmm. slash has to be left there, just like you did, yeah. But just for yes. people. Yes, this one, Not for, don't forget this one. So here we can see that we have 
the our sign up running and if you if you use the same URL that I mentioned that is on the other part you too you can open the, the app easily and we will have here It takes a while also. This is one of the things that uh, Binder has, but here you can open the same app that we have deployed, but using an RS Studio ID, only changing the way you write the URL. So if we see here, we have the repo, the app, and in this case, we can not only uh, run the app, again, from, from the console or the toolbar. If not, also modify the code if you want. I mean, if you want to share the code with someone and let the other person modify it, this is a good way definitely to do it. So, well, this is the idea behind Binder. I don't know if Pablo, you want to add anything else? No, it sounds good. Um, uh, well, uh, also uh, that's it for Shiny App. You can also use it for, yeah. So we have our studio as well as uh, Shiny Apps. And yeah, I think the MRAN is really nice. Uh, you realize this with some statistical packages that change versions and then <clears throat> things do change and the warning messages especially will change which is not a problem if you have the right mrun uh, time. So the, in the runtime.txt file, you have your dates there. And that, that's, that's what you think. Uh, also, something that I did not explain is that the default version of R that Binder is running is 3.6. If you want to change the version of R, you can do it. Um, you can just, I will, show you because we have some time to do it. Uh, it is including the name of the R version here. Here. Yeah. Well, my computer is not cooperating here. So you can specify a particular R version if you want. If not, it will use 3.6. Yeah, uh, I'd like to mention that there's the caveat that um, the very latest version cannot be used yet. Uh, so there's a bit of a lag uh, in, in Binder. So it's not accepting the 4.0 version or any further. So I think the, the latest it's accepting is 3.6. That's just to, to be noticed. Okay. Um, we can also mention the Gitter channel to ask questions. It's interesting. Uh, yeah. You have the link? The either channel? The Ah, uh, sorry. Etherpad? No. Which one? <laughs> oh, Gitter. All right. All right. Gitter. Yes. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So you do you have the link? I don't have it here. Ah, uh, well, if if they Google Gitter. So that's G-I-T-T-E-R um, binder. That it will take them straight to it. Yeah, so there, there's a large community and there's a lot of support and forums for these open source tools often. So that's really Ray good. Yeah. Rachel asks, is there any other setup needed to use binder besides the random and instant files in the repo? Uh, it's running. <laughs> it's so easy, you know? It's quite easy to use. Uh, no, 
uh, there are, I mean, it could be, um, I don't know, I don't know what to say, it's, it's easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's quite straightforward. Uh, sometimes, I don't know, we, you could have a, something with a package uh, remotely uh, in case, I don't know, regarding a version um, of R with the 4.0, a big uh, change was introduced in R, but yeah, but normally. I think you can have, I don't know, maybe you remember Pablo, but I think that you can have problems if you have big data sets. Yeah. Yes, there are limitations. I mean, it's not. Um, yeah, yeah, but normally it's, it's really worth trying out. Definitely. Also, you told me about this, uh, that, well, you can deploy Shiny, but dashboards yet is not possible. Yeah. Yeah, per yeah. So perhaps uh, I can uh, we can look at how to just mention that uh, as I hinted at uh, in the Flex Dashboard section, the Shiny framework for user inputs that uh, Florencia just covered can be added to Flex Dashboard. Uh, you could I share the screen uh, in a moment? Uh, yes, sorry, I will. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So that's done. Uh, adding runtime shiny, basically. So in the YAML header, you can add runtime shiny. Uh, and and that in that way, you allow for interactivity or reactivity. Uh, as it's called uh, shiny reactivity in Flex Dashboard. And that will create a, a Flex Dashboard shiny document, which is nice because the Flex Dashboard has a, a, a very nice, this is in, in the first link to the RStudio, in the first RStudio Cloud project in the Etherpad. And if you go to other examples, you can see there are two documents. One of them is a, a Flex Dashboard uh, proper. And the other is a Flex Dashboard Shiny, which is a, a web application. So with, with this, I mentioned the distinction between the terms uh, dashboard and web application. They're interchangeable, but we could distinguish them in the sense that Flex Dashboard ref, uh, or Dashboard refers to more of a static, a slightly state, more static a kind of mm, document um, which doesn't have shiny operations on it. So uh, th these two examples right in the RStudio Cloud project show that. So if you run the, f the, um, the one that says R pops, maybe we can, uh, say, since we have uh, gone a bit faster than we expect it, which is a great surprise. And, and it's uh, because in my section, I went a little faster eventually, which is unprecedented. Uh, now we have to <laughs> cover, uh, we, we welcome uh, participants' questions, of course, and then we can look at some pending issues. Uh, Florencia, if anything comes to mind, please. Otherwise, uh, I can also mention uh, these issues of RPOPs and shinyapps.io Right, so um, all right, so this is a flex dashboard, uh, and it's well, it's a, a large one, and to to a large extent, it may look like it's reactive, it's interactive, but it can be much more if we add shiny. And how does that work? Well, um, if we move to the uh, to this file, uh, the the one without R pops. Well, I've done here is add runtime shiny at the end of the YAML header, runtime colon shiny, and then uh, add some inputs. So uh, this is a sidebar, 
is creating a sidebar with the dot sidebar argument in the, within the column options, and then just some inputs from Shiny, uh, similar to the ones that um, that uh, Florencia was covering, which are all available in in Shiny in in our studios. Uh, um, documents basically, so shiny inputs. There are dozens of them probably, and uh, so this is one. Um, and this is this particular one is an action link, right? So uh, what I'm going to do with this one is create a, a modal dialog. Uh, this is an action link, which is creating a link. Um, observe events because this gets a bit more complex, but it's because uh, there are reactive um, operations inside. This is more advanced. You you will look at it uh, if you need to get to that extent. And then just uh, to mention the fact that you can incorporate uh, Shiny into Flex Dashboard. Um, and what this does, the difference between the previous one and this one is that it's extended to include user inputs. Um, right, so now I mentioned this because this type of a Shiny app, now the Flex Dashboard plus Shiny app can still not be put into, um, into Binder. Uh, although uh, well, hopefully it, it may in future, but not yet. Uh, so what can uh -huh. we do one then we can i'm going to show the difference right so this sidebar um with all these inputs is is what shiny brings uh so you can subset the data set with all these inputs and get the output so if we do this it changes everything it changes but the whole data that we're looking at we can download, which is also allowed by Shiny, not uh, the pure flex dashboard and that kind of thing. All right, uh, what can we do with this one? We can publish it. Uh, Florencia referred to it before. Publish just this document. Next, we enter, we want to enter our shinyapps.io account here. How do we go about that? We go to shinyapps.io. I'm going to do it in well, uh, you create an account on shinyapps.io uh, through your email or GitHub. It will take you to a dashboard. If you click here, tokens show. Click show and then click also show private and then copy that. And it's a sort of long uh, chunk, code chunk. That's private. Uh, so you just, because it's private, you just take it here on your own and connect, say connect account. And that will enable this. And then you will hit publish and it, it will be, you will publish to shinyapps.io, which is a shiny server, which shiny apps need. They cannot be uh, published like flex dashboards do. So this is uh, the main distinction, right? So flex dashboard can be published as a website in our pubs or in your personal website. Shiny applications, wherever you have any shiny inputs, you need to publish that into uh, either Binder, which anything that has a shiny server in it, Binder have um, enabled shiny server, shinyapps.io has a, a great shiny server from our studio. And, and then you could even install that on your own. So, um, mm -hmm. right. so that's okay. And then, uh, Florencia, would you like to mention anything else? Yes, because I was thinking that other thing you can do, maybe if you are working on a shiny app is like to create a new branch in the repo and make the deployment with Binder from that branch, because in that way you can continue working in your shiny app if you are doing modifications and also have a branch where the uh, Shiny app is is actually working. Uh, I have used it. I don't know if you 
any of you are familiar with the tutorials of Ines Montani, the framework that she prepared. Well, she uses a framework for the tutorials that uses Binder, that's why I know about it. Uh, and this is the way you, you have the exercise there. Um, it's a tutorial, I, I don't know if you, you know what I am talking about, these tutorials, free online tutorials, you can accede. Um, um, and uh, it's quite easy to, to have the examples of the exercise to run in, in the chunks for, for the students of the people that want to, to run this. If you give me one minute, I can open one for you. Um, any questions or other? Uh, I, I mentioned that uh, the version of kind of shiny apps for our markdown documents is called um, uh, RPAX. So we looked at that already. So you can publish uh, our markdown documents, including flex dashboards and standard R markdown documents into RPAX. For from. example, I am sharing the screen again. Uh, this is the this is the framework I am saying. You can enter to any of the chapters and what allows you to to run the the code of the tutorial. It is binder. So to prepare these tutorials, basically you have to have the exercises in files and then generate with binder as we have seen for the shiny app. Uh, on the RStudio ID, you see that it says launching Docker container in my binder. So this is another use you can have for binder. You know also now uh, how to how to create a tutorial <laughs> in a 25% maybe, uh, but it's, it's the idea behind this. So really, it's it's really interesting the, the all the things that you can do with binder, and it's not so difficult at maybe generating a, a Docker image and it takes a while, that's the problem, but it's, it's quite useful. Okay, we are on time, I think. Yeah, <laughs> uh, so any, any further? The, uh, Florencia, I don't know if you already uh, sort of were addressing uh, Chris's question in the chat. How can we help novices who still find it difficult to follow these things? Well, the, the advice that Florence just mentioned from Binder is kind of uh, related to that uh, for creating tutorials. Uh, and, and then uh, regarding this workshop, we have several materials in the, and links to in the etherpads, uh, as well as the our Studio Cloud project and this very video, very video uh, all will remain available uh, for use at, at any point. Uh, thank all of you for gaming. Uh, I am very happy. And thank you, Paolo, also. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. It has been a nice experience for me. Yeah. <laughs> me too. All right. So uh, if there are any outstanding questions, please feel free. Any, any Our things? emails are on the either part if you want to send an email and saying how much you like the course, the, the, the workshop. <laughs> We are receiving this kind of emails. Also questions. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I'm going to stop recording now.